Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Chat, where we're working to destroy and dismantle stereotypes about justice-impacted people. We can't wait for you to hear from our next guest, so stay tuned. Um, we are here with another episode of The Chat, and we are here today with Serena uh, Martin Lingori, with the executive director of A New Hour, and we're just so happy to have you on. Thank you so much, Alicia. Great to be here. I'm super excited to get into conversation. Um, and yeah, great to be here. Yeah, very excited to have you. i um, been following a lot of your work for a long time, so it's it's wonderful to have you here. I think uh, we'd love to start off with our listeners and viewers just on, you know, um, a little bit more about you and why criminal legal reform and abolition is something that's important to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, most folks know my story. Uh, I came to this work because I was incarcerated. Um, I was uh, in college and um, family tragedy hit, hit uh, mental health issues in, in my family with my parents, uh, with my parent, and it led to my incarceration. Um, I talk a lot about sort of what that moment when I had my 21st birthday in prison and those moments behind bars when I was very young. Um, and to this day, I think back about sort of reflecting on who that young woman was and um, very different than who I am now. And I also think that for most women and most people, we often end up in situations where we don't think we have choices. And, um, you know, I would say as a survivor of my parents' mental illness and of abuse because of that, not intentionally, but because of being, uh, you know, coerced into a, to a crime, which was a tragedy, I think a lot about how the system continues to um, create either ors for women, especially for women. Um, and so when I came home from prison, I sort of thought life would go back to normal. You know, I just thought, okay, I'm going to pick up the pieces, start fresh, but very much like coming back from war, you are forever changed by the trauma you've survived, the isolated confinement, the abuse, um, and also impacted by the stories of the other people you were incarcerated with. Um, and so for me, as a Puerto Rican woman, uh, I saw my sisters behind bars, predominantly black and brown women, who were the majority of women in New York State's prisons and are throughout the country. And it and it was um it was a moment, a, a wake up call to me that there's something deeply, deeply flawed with our system, that it's so overtly racist based on gender, ethnicity uh, and, and money, right? Like how much money you have to afford an attorney. Um, so when I came home and finished my degree and worked three jobs, I got, got a job at Starbucks. The guy, the manager said, you can park your bike in the back. And I rode my bike to work every day. Um, you know, I think that founding New Hour was really about how do we create support and community for other women coming home when there is nothing out there for women who return to our community other than more added stigma, uh, stigma and shame. Thank you so much. I appreciate you diving into your own personal story and like how that impacted you and, you know, um, the founding of this, this great organization that helps people. I heard you mention in there that there, you know, while you had directly experienced um, incarceration that you had noticed that there was like an either or for women. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that just a little bit further. Yeah, I think you know, one of the interesting things is when I was incarcerated, I don't think um, I and many of the women I was there with had an understanding that the choices they made were also part of a deeply flawed system that oppresses women. And I think we often, you know, we take full responsibility, full accountability for our mistakes, our crimes, the things we've done wrong. And I don't think that 
often enough, our court system takes a look at what are the underpinnings? What are the underlying harms that, um, like in my case, if my parent had gotten mental health support, I wouldn't have been put in a position I was put in. And I think a lot of times that our court system still views people who um, commit harm as uh, needing punishment, needing reform, not necessarily as the fact that our society has really failed to create systems to catch people when there is abuse, mental health issues, substance abuse issues, um, su substance abuse disorder. And it it's still very much the case. So, you know, at New Hour, we work with anywhere from 100 to 300 women a month. We run programs in our jails across Long Island. Um, we have some of the largest population of, of people behind bars in New York State outside of Rikers Island and Rosie's for women in New York City. So there's a high population of women who are incarcerated out here on Long Island. And I think that often even coming home from incarceration, there's a sense of, put it behind you, apologize and kind of move forward. And I think often most women um, have so much that they've survived. And so for me, it's not about how we give people a handout. It's really how do we learn from sur survivors who have been incarcerated and have been put in situations and they've still survived. So, um, you know, no, I think one of the things like coming down the the pike that we're working on uh, with our staff at New Hour is really looking at how to create human rights standards for incarcerated women who are pregnant, who have uh, infants behind bars. Uh, that's not standard. That's not something that is automatic. You know, most jails and prisons are run by the superintendent or sheriff and whatever their priority is, is how it's run. And so we have a jail in Suffolk County that has a nursery program for incarcerated moms and infants. And in Nassau County, just 40 minutes away, once you have an infant, that infant is taken away at birth because you can't keep your infant behind bars. And so this is something that, um, you know, we find deeply, obviously we all find deeply flawed about the system, but also when you incarcerate women, most of the courts do not consider whether or not they are pregnant, whether or not what that impact is going to be on their children or the children that they're caretakers for. And so when you incarcerate a primary caretaker, you're incarcerating and creating trauma for their entire family. Yeah, thank you for this amazing work that you're doing and like and centering it um, here in this conversation for our listeners too. I appreciate that you started with those that are most impacted as well, like who's being impacted by these things and, you know, bringing up how that there could be, potentially be resources or alternatives, right, when you're talking about the services that people just need in the community before they even get to this point of incarceration, how we could prevent some of these things by thinking of other solutions. Um, and then, you know, going into what your organization New Hour does as far as providing, you know, the services that are necessary to women that are incarcerated. Um, yeah, you had mentioned that you have like the human rights standards. Like, what does that look like? I don't think everybody, I don't think everybody would resonate with that just off the bat unless they had been incarcerated or been pregnant and incarcerated or or a woman potentially. <laughs> so then, you know, so how, like, what does this mean? Why do we need human rights standards? And why, why particularly women that have children or that are pregnant? Yeah. You know, I think this, this is why I remember sitting in my living room and hearing that Roe v. Wade had been overturned and immediately thinking about what that impact is going to look like on women and how women are going to be inadvertently criminalized for um for choice and i you know i think that very often women are criminalized for a lot of reasons and this is just one more reason that is going to kind of skyrocket the number of women we see behind bars and that number has risen by 800% since like 1985 
Um, and everyone goes, well, why is that? And I think that this is a perfect example of uh, as to why. And I also think you're right. Most people don't think about women being pregnant behind bars. Well, you know, I think, I think there is a lot of room in the courts to create alternative to incarceration programming for pregnant people. And yet that is never taken into consideration when sentencing um, someone who is pregnant for, for committing a crime or allegedly. And I, I feel like when we go into the jails, I'll give you a couple examples. And I'm sure, you know, some of us who've done this work here and see it all the time, um, we had a, a woman who was put into solitary confinement, eight months pregnant, didn't get enough food. We have another woman who gave birth to an infant, was allowed to keep the infant, but there were ants crawling in the cell. And so the officers sprayed raid in the cell to kill the ants while the infant and mother were in the cell. So there's a lot of, you know, jails are not meant to keep people safe the way that the community would like to think so. And I feel like when we incarcerate pregnant women, we really are um, setting them setting them up for more abuse and trauma. And so creating standards where if you have an infant that there be access to distilled water for bottles, uh, breast pumps for breastfeeding, um, a nursing station, a quiet space for privacy. Um, you know, when you think about bringing an infant into the world, and most folks don't don't know this unless you're a parent, that there's a lot of of things that need to be sanitized and sterilized, and there's a lot of materials that you need. And often, women behind bars want to keep their infant with them, but most importantly, infants flourish when kept with their their mother during the first um, year of their life. And so the data, you know, shows that an infant's health and their ability to be resilient and in the future has a lot to do with that first year of birth. And, um, you know, I think that most of our women who are incarcerated, there's there's a handful who are pregnant and have overwhelming obstacles when they keep that infant with them or if they give that infant up. Um, and so, you know, we are going to be introducing a bill. Uh, we introduced it last session in New York State with Senator Salazar and Assemblymember Kellis uh, as co-sponsors of the bill that would really create standard human rights for the care of infants behind bars and for the access to reproductive health and health equity care for incarcerated moms. That's amazing. I mean, phenomenal work on that. Uh, is it, is this bill, do you have um, like bill numbers that you can share? And also is it based off of something that's being done in another country or in, in any other states, or is this kind of like groundbreaking model? You know, um, this this would be the first. So, I should say there has been a longstanding children's center and nursery in the maximum state prison for women in New York State at Bedford Hills. Um, there's also a nursery program at at Taconic. But what most people don't know is that unless you're sentenced to a year or more time, most of your time is going to be served in the jail. So if you're getting a sentence of one year you're going to be in the jail and you might even be detained for a year or two awaiting the adjudication of your trial in jail. So for instance, one of our moms gave birth in the jail, was able to keep her infant for his first year in jail. And we offered programming to her. And because we were able to work with the sheriff, we were able to get her, you know, age appropriate educational toys and music and breastfeeding information. Um, and a lactation specialist, but that's only because we have a good relationship with our, our sheriff here. If that was any other jail and you didn't have a provider like New Hour in that county, that might not happen. Um, and the same can be said even for state prisons. So it's really up to the superintendent who's in charge of that state prison, how much um, they wanna focus on that for women and infants behind bars and how much is that a part of, um, 
their priorities. And so this bill would create those standards. Um, I will get you the bill numbers. I think it's A7630. I'll, I'll get the Senate side um, number. And, you know, I think, so we've been working with Cornell Law um, to kind of come up with what are the standards in other states. What we've seen so far is that there is no such great standard in any state. Um, I'd love to hear more from folks who um, who are who are doing this work in their states, but certainly in New York State, there's there is no law like this yet. Great. Well, I'm glad that you guys are working on it. And and if people are interested in supporting and getting involved, what would be the best way that they can do that? Yeah. So feel free to uh, email me, contact me on Twitter, Insta, Facebook, all that good stuff. But my email is s Ligori, so s l i g u. O-R-I at new hour, N-E-W-H-O-U-R-L-I dot org. Um, and, and I would also say that, you know, our, so new hours mission is to really empower and support justice impacted women, children, and families. And we see the policy work as an extension of our direct support. So we can provide all of the direct services, all of the educational support, the 15 programs in the jails every week with our staff and social workers. But if you're not really able to attack the systemic failures of our criminal justice system at a policy level, we are going to continue to be playing catch up. We're going to continue to be the ones going, okay, we've got a mom who has to give her infant up. And how are we going to provide services for this infant? Or how are we going to make sure that she can, um, you know, breastfeed until she has to give the infant up? Um, very often, these smaller or seemingly smaller issues don't rise to the attention of very often male-dominated fields, such as Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, such as jails. So, you know, I think for us, we found ourselves in the position of having to advocate for a mother to get breast milk to her infant who was taken out of the jail because she's not allowed to keep the infant in the jail, couldn't get permission for the breast milk to be frozen and taken out. And so the child, the infant is the person who's suffering. And so these are issues that, again, very nuanced, very gender specific, very much relating to women and infants. And yet there are issues that most men or most corrections and safety folks just don't have, um, have just aren't being called to think about, and they should be. Absolutely, that makes sense. And I mean, I, I'm so glad that you're working on a human rights standard there in New York so that it can bring that attention. Because I think sometimes people just don't have the information and it's, you know, they don't think of it outside the concept of what affects them and impacts them directly and so this i'm so glad that there is your organization that is doing this and i've heard you kind of almost argue like two points in the sense of saying like the first point is if women are incarcerated and they're pregnant or have a you know a young child that there are necessary human rights that need to be established so that there can be these services in jails both jails and prisons and that just needs to be a universal standard and then I also heard you saying, maybe we should reconsider, are these people even being sentenced to these types of carceral environments in the first place? Yeah, I mean, I, I make the argument all the time as sort of someone who was harmed by the justice system that, you know, I had, I remember the district attorney telling me and my attorney at the time of my sentencing, well, her going to prison is going to allow her to um, pay her dues and to, you know, by the time she's done with her sentence, she'll uh, she'll have had some accountability and and can no longer, you know, won't have to live with the guilt and shame of 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 what she's done. And the truth is, like, if you commit harm, you're always going to live with that guilt and shame, and you're going to figure out ways to give back or ways to um, sort of rectify your own sense of self and of choices you've made. But number two, jail and prison has never done anyone any good. And so especially incarcerating 
pregnant women makes absolutely no sense. And um, I think the argument is well made by most of us who are not just abolitionists, but also feel like there are other ways to hold people accountable and to get them the services they need and to make sure that we honor people who have survived harm. And um, incarcerating a pregnant woman certainly doesn't do that. Yeah, absolutely. I would agree with you there. And, and like you had mentioned too, it's like you're, you, you're also punishing a child, like a completely innocent child. And also, like you mentioned, people that do do harm, right, um, are always looking for ways to give back. Some of the most giving, amazing, dedicated people, you know, um, are not only just focused on their own healing, they're they're focused on the healing of their communities, as are, are as are you and and many of the people that I've come in contact with. So, um, yeah, I'm just again, I'm glad that you're you're really doing this work and that you're amplifying it, and I I'm excited to see what happens in New York State. Thank you, and you know, I I do think that. I remember I did an interview with Senator Tom Duane when he had a radio show years ago. And he said to me, like, explain to our listeners what a woman behind bars looks like. Who is she? And sort of give give the sort of drawing of who this person is. And, you know, one of the things that I found when I went to prison was mentors, mentors like Kathy Boudin, who sort of held my hand and held my soul when I was really crumbling. Um, people who are probably the most thoughtful and um, engaged people in, in that I've ever met outside of my community. And I think there's something about not just the hardship of prison and the oppression of prison, but I think there's something about creating a sisterhood in spaces that are oppressive that brings out um, not that there should be oppressive spaces, but that does really bring us together. And I remember like cooking with my Spanish friends and feeling like this was the first time I felt really supported. And ironically, that was in prison. Um, and of course, it doesn't take away from locking in at night and being abused and all of the harm that happens there. And um, strip searches and lack of sanitary pads, all of the things that make prison awful. But the community of people behind bars, you know, I was very lucky because I was in Bedford Hills at a time when, you know, Cheryl Wilkins, you know, helped me to get my associate's degree. And now she is running a program at Columbia Center for Justice, um, being honored at a gala coming up on Tuesday. And I think about uh, you know, how you find your people, right? Like you can find your people anywhere and it doesn't really matter if you're behind bars or not. I feel like the universe really ordained my path and put people in my path to be, you know, true angels to me. And then, you know, sort of people who I feel like I can pass on what it is they showed me to the next woman coming home. I love that. Thank you for sharing that and talking about the community that exists. And I think, you know, there's a lot of conversation about like fearing people that we incarcerate and like that's breaking down the majority of the people, a large majority of the people that are incarcerated or have been incarcerated are not people to be feared. They are people that have the ability to unite and do unite both inside and outside as community and people that love each other and support each other and work together, um, pulling in the same direction. So Thank you for highlighting that. And is there a specific mentor that has been pivotal to you and that like has characteristics that have that you've looked at or have adopted yourself that you that you want to talk a little bit more about? Yeah, absolutely. And I was saying this before we started taping. Um, this is the third time I've heard the word mentor come up in conversation this past week. And it's really, really interesting to me because I think about how do we um stay inspired? How do we stay grounded? How do we stay connected to the issue without like the real burnout? That is absolutely the case for activists and organizers and, you know, folks who are EDs in nonprofits. And I will say my, my very first mentor was Sister Elaine Roulette, who passed on, but she gave me a job in the prison. We worked with the mentally and terminally ill 
Um, and she literally held my hand when the parole board denied me parole. I came out of the parole hearing just devastated. And I remember her standing there and, and, and sitting with me and holding my hand and crying right along with me. And I think mentors are people who will walk your walk with you and not necessarily have all the answers, but deeply understand what you need. Um, and so, you know, another mentor of mine is Tracy Gardner at the Legal Action Center. Uh, I've turned to her for advice over the years and uh, career advice and mom advice, you know, as a mom of a, of a 12 year old boy, uh, you know, I think this work can be overwhelming. And um, it's also sort of this juxtaposition between like, who do I identify with as a person in life? And how does my advocacy sh uh, shape that? And what is that legacy that I leave to my my child, to my children, to, to those who may continue to do other kinds of things in life? And I think one of the things that Tracy um, has always sort of sort of exemplified for me is just like being genuinely real about the challenges in this work and like the people who are not trustworthy and the pe like there's all kinds of people in all spaces but also like it's about your perspective it's about where you're going and sort of staying focused on what your mission is and you know what's going to bring not just the most impact in the community but what's also like healing you and I often think about this because my own healing journey is one of really accepting myself. And this is something that like, I think a lot of women, but I think especially growing up in a very conservative, like Christian, born again, Christian um, community created a lot of religious harm for me and a lot of kind of you can't be too attractive. You can't dress too, you know, inappropriate. And I think it's taken a long time to undo some of those like learned um, judgments that, you know, I think ultimately, you know, no, my parents did not want me to live with a sense of stigma or shame, but it it is, it was perpetuated in the, in the way in which I was raised. And I also think that, you know, a mentor is somebody who literally may not just have the answers for you, but may have choices for you to think about. And again, going back to that, like, it's not either or it's, it's kind of like, where is the gray and, and how do we live in that space? Because, um, you know, life is certainly not black and white. Thank you for highlighting all of that. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, it does. I do have to comment that it always breaks my heart a little bit when I hear about, you know, like religious trauma and how that's taken because it's it's always a story that's so opposite of what um, Christian values are. And and that is um, that's always heartbreaking. But I am wonder I'm like very happy to hear that you've had these wonderful mentors that have walked alongside you, not always had the answers, sometimes had really great advice and um you know just helped be a part of that community that makes you you um and makes you be able to continue to do this work through the hard times so i know that we're running short on time and we have to let you go but is there any final thoughts that you you want to say to our um to our listeners and viewers right before we close or you feel like you've covered all the things i feel like i could talk to you for a really long time because <laughs> i know you're doing a lot of great work <laughs> Um, no, I, I mean, I feel like, uh, you know, you're certainly a breath of fresh air and it's so good to have spaces like this to discuss these issues. And I feel like I just feel heartened by these kinds of conversations because it does sort of remind me that we have so much more in common than, than not in, and, and I think much of the sort of perceived judgment of our community while we may have folks who are on like wildly polar opposites in terms of our political views or life choices or what have you I think when people really hear about the specific issues that impact women behind bars I don't have yet to meet someone who says like oh that doesn't make sense yes we should be harming infants and and pregnant women behind bars you know so I do think that these conversations leave me hopeful uh, for what we can accomplish together.
I feel the same. And just thank you so much for your time today and coming on the chat to speak with all of us. Thanks, Alicia. Thank you for being with us for another episode of The Chat. We appreciate all of our listeners, viewers, and supporters. If you want to know more about The Uplift in The Chat, head over to our website at www.upliftmentors.org. Join our coalition, drop us a donation, or just spread some love and share this around with your friends and family.